Okay, so today we're going to talk about the risk and return of individual securities. What do we mean by individual securities? It could be a stock, it could be a bond, all sorts of things, but we're not talking about portfolios here or mutual funds or anything like that. We're talking about individual securities. So, there are a couple of ways that we get returns from the financial assets that we buy. And one of those ways is from payments. If you buy a stock, you might receive dividends. We're going to learn that you don't have to receive dividends. It's not required, but you might. And if you buy a bond, with very few exceptions, you're going to receive periodic payments on those. We do have stuff called zero coupon bonds that don't make periodic payments, but we'll talk about them in chapter five. So those are the two kinds of series of payments that we talk about. You could even think about if you buy a rent house, those payments that you receive rent are uh, returns on that investment. And then we have the capital gain. That's how much the value of this thing goes up over the time that you're holding it. And so some stocks might never pay a dividend, but you expect to sell them for more than you paid for them. And the difference would be the capital gain. And we can go back to the rent house and say if you bought it for $300,000 and you eventually sold it for $400,000, you would have a $100,000 capital gain in addition to all those monthly rents that you received. So for the purposes of our discussion today, we will be using stocks. Make sure that's plugged in. There we go. We will be using stocks. And so we'll be talking about the increase in the share price as our capital gain. And we'll be talking about the dividends as our payments that we receive. And there's a couple of ways that we can look at returns. And the first one is the simplest. It's just dollar returns or total dollar returns. And it's just what it sounds like. It's the return on your investment stated in dollars. So let's work a little example here. We have 100 shares of stock that we bought for $37 a share. The stock pays an annual dividend of $1.85 per share. And at the end of the year, the stock is selling for $40.33. Can someone tell me the two ways that we're going to make money from owning this stock? Dividends is the first, and what's the second one? Yeah, the capital gain going from 37 up to 43. Now it's asking what our dollar return is on the stock investment for the year. Now, do you actually have to sell the stock at the end of the year to be able to calculate this return? No, we call that a paper gain, right? Just like right now, I've got some paper losses because the stock market's taking a dump lately, but they're just on paper because I haven't sold yet, but I can still calculate my return. Okay, now let's talk about, there's two ways to approach this. One, we could figure out the total dollars of dividends, and we could figure out the total dollars of capital gains, bless you, and add them together. But I'm going to tell you an easier way, and that is to figure out the dividend per share, which we've already given, and then the capital gain per share, add that together, and then multiply it by 100. It saves you one step of multiplying. Okay, so how much are we gaining per share on dividend? Uh, I said dividend. You're thinking ahead. Yeah, it's right there, right? $1.85. Now, I'm going to ask you because you were victorious answering this question. Uh, what is the capital gain? $3.33. $3.33. So I would suggest that we just add $1.85 and $3.33 together. What do you get? What happens when you add $1.85 and $3.33? Well, yeah, $5.18 per share, right? And once again, you skipped ahead one step. So our final step here to figure out what is our total dollar gain is to multiply by 100. And that would give us $518. Now, we could have figured out that it was $333 uh, capital gain and $185 dividends and added those together and we come up with exactly the same number. So whatever makes life easier for you, that's what you should do. And there's our, there's our calculation. Now let's ask this question. What piece of information are we missing here? If I tell you I had total 
dollar returns of 518, would you know whether or not to be impressed? Mr. Ali, you and I are at the cocktail party. I say, Phew, I had returns of $518. How do you know whether or not to be impressed? You really don't, do you? Because if you, you know, the question you're going to ask me is, wow, what did you invest? And if I say I invested $1,000 and got 518 total dollar returns, are you impressed now? No. No? 51.8% return? Let's say over the period of a year. 51.8%. And you're not impressed. What the hell does it take to impress you, Mr. Ali? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Most people would be. Hey, are you one of those crypto people? No. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> By the way, crypto, total smoke and mirrors, leave that crap alone. Okay, back to the story. Most of you would know to be impressed at 51.8% return, because you do that math and you have 518 divided by 1,000, you say 51.8%. But uh, what if I said I invested $1 million to get that? Are you impressed? You're like, crap, I'm getting better than that on my checking account, right? And so the piece of information that we're missing here is what did we have to invest in order to get that 518 bucks? Does that make sense? Okay. Now we're on to percentage returns. This is another way of looking at returns. And we're going to start talking about things called yields. The percentage return from dividends is called the dividend yield. And the percentage return from capital gains is called the capital gains yield. And dividend yield is pretty easy to figure out. The one thing that messes people up is this t plus 1 and t thing. So here's the way I'm going to explain this to you. At the beginning, which is time t, you're going to pay p for this thing, for a share of stock. And then at the end of the year, for your trouble, you will receive a dividend. Now, that dividend is going to be happening at time t plus 1, because it happens at the end of the year. You've got to buy that stock at the beginning of the year in order to be able to get that dividend at the end. And that's your investment, that initial price, p sub t. And so that's why we're looking at the dividend yield being the dividend at time t plus 1 divided by the price at time t. So if time t was 3, what would the dividend be? If we were looking at p3 for dividend yield, the dividend would be number which one? Yeah, it had to be number 4, right? Okay, now capital gains is a little more tricky. We have to take the price at the end of the period, subtract the price at the beginning of the period, and then divide by the price at the beginning of the period. And the rationale is the same. In order to be able to get that return, to be able to sell for p sub t plus 1, we have to purchase it for p sub t at the beginning. So that's why that's on the bottom in our return calculation. And of course, p sub t plus 1 minus p sub t is that increase that happened in the stock price over the period of the year. By the way, does it always have to be a positive increase? No, sometimes it could be negative. Stock prices go down. Now, that means that capital gains yield could either be positive or negative. What about dividend yields? Can dividend yields ever be negative? No, there's no such thing as a negative dividend. There's no such thing as a negative dividend. Now, if we want to know our total percentage return, all we have to do is add our dividend yield and our capital gains yield together. All we have to do is add these two things together. Now, here's the fun thing. You could have a positive total return, even if you had a negative capital gains yield. How is that possible, Mr. Polinsky? How could we possibly have a positive total return when the capital gains yield is negative? What would have to be true of the dividend yield? Yeah, it's got to be more positive than the capital returns is negative. Does that make sense? And so that's how we could have a positive total return even if capital gains yield was negative. Any questions? Okay, so we're going to go ahead and figure out our percentage returns based on our last example. Um, we've got $1.85 at time t plus 1. 
The price that we paid for those shares at the beginning for time T was $37. $1.85 divided by 37 is 5%. Our capital gains, uh, we know that it's $3.33. So 40.33 minus 37 divided by, once again, 37. Tells us our capital gains yield is 9%. And so when we add those two things together, we can see that our total percentage return is 14%. Now let's talk about how we can bring this back uh, and link these two concepts up, total dollar returns and total percentage returns. What happens if I take 14% of my initial total investment? So I have $37 times 100 is $3,700 multiplied by 0.14 and I get 518, which is my total dollar return. So these things are totally related, absolutely totally related. I could have also taken my total dollar return, divided by my initial investment, and I would have gotten my total percentage return. Questions? Yeah? In a, in a negative capital gains year, companies that pay dividends, yeah. Okay, so he's asking a good question here. He says, do companies typically pay dividends in a negative capital gains year? And the answer is, like everything else in life, it depends. And here is why a company would go ahead and, and even uh, have a negative capital gains. What if they had negative net income or zero net income? Would they still pay dividends? Sometimes they do. And the reason they do is because they're sending a signal. They're sending a signal that our current troubles are only temporary and we foresee the cash flow coming back. So there's no need for us to stop paying our dividends. Occasionally you'll see companies that are in the situation you described where they've got negative capital gains, their net income looks like crap, and they say, okay, we surrender. We have to stop paying dividends. Um, there have been a couple of situations here lately. I think GE stopped paying dividends. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, the question is this. What do you think happens to the share price when you say, not paying dividends anymore? Oh, yeah, it's going to go down. And if I, in, if I uh, report an increase in dividends, my stock price goes up. But if I recorded an equal decrease in dividends, my stock goes down much further. We call that an asymmetric response. And so you get punished a whole lot more for cutting your dividend, then you get rewarded for increasing it. And so what does that mean? It means that managers are reluctant to raise dividends because they don't want to take the beating if they have to eventually then lower them. Does that make sense? Yeah, so signals are only credible if they're costly. So students come to me all the time and they tell me Oh, I've worked so hard. I've spent so many hours on this, this, that, and the other. Now, is their signal credible? No. How would it be, how, what would be a costly signal? Well, what if I could actually go into the system, which I can, and I can see how much time you've actually spent on this stuff. If you spent the time and you come into my office and you say, take a look at how much I've been working on this, and then we can talk, that's more of a costly signal. Can you fake that signal? Uh, probably the more clever of you could, but uh, most people would, it wouldn't even bother, right? Can you believe it when a company CEO tells you, don't worry, everything's fine? No, that's usually an absolute lie. How can they demonstrate that everything's fine? A costly signal. Dividends are a costly signal. Does that make sense? Okay. So now let's take a look at some different individual securities and how they perform through time. And what we've got here are two different axes. On the vertical axis, we've got return, and on the horizontal axis, we've got time. And the return is in a weird way. Notice you're used to seeing um, 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and so forth. That would be a regular scale. This is a log scale. And so the first increment is 0 to 1, the second one's 1 to 10, and then so forth, uh, 10 to 100, and so forth. Now, the reason that we do that is because what we want 
is for a 10% return to be the, represented the same down low as it is up high. If we did a 10% return up high on a regular scale, whew, it would be like this tall. Um, but if we did it down low on a regular scale, it's going to be much lower. Wake up. Okay, so what we're going to do is use this log scale on the left hand side. And what we've got here is uh, what happens if we invest a dollar on December 31st, 1925. Now why is December 31st, 1925 so epic? The answer is we have reliable stock data going back, uh, securities data, going back to January 1st, 1926. Did we have a stock market before that? Of course we did. We've been trading stocks under the buttonwood tree on Wall Street for over 300 years. But uh, do we have reliable records? No. And so that's why this is the way it is. Okay, now we're going to invest a dollar in all these different things and we're going to see what happens. I believe this one year in 2013, uh, what uh, that dollar that invested back in uh, basically 1926, what's it worth now? And so the first thing we'll look at is inflation. You really can't invest in inflation, but the inflation provides a baseline. In order for us to have real returns, in other words, to be able to actually increase our consumption as a result of making an investment, our investments have to yield more than inflation. And inflation, uh, basically $12.81 would be required at the end of 2013 to buy the same things that were required or that a dollar would buy you back in 1926. And after my conversations with my grandfather, I think that sounds about right. That's just roughly in line with some of the things that he told me the prices on different things were. Okay, now, right now, inflation is running six, eight, nine percent and I'm making 4% uh, on my savings account. Am I making a positive real return? No, I'm actually losing purchasing power. Does that make sense? And so the good news here is all of these things that we're looking at over the long haul have managed to beat inflation. So they all provide a positive real rate of return. In other words, they all increase your ability to consume. Okay, now, the next lineup, that green line, is the Treasury bill. The Treasury bill is the debt of the United States federal government, which is our central government, and it is a Treasury bill. It has a maturity of three months. Three months. There are shorter maturities, but we don't use them. We use the three months because it's the most popular. Now there are, uh, let's see, if we invest a dollar back in the day, that would have been worth $20.57. And so again, that sounds pretty good, up 20.5x 20, up 20 from where we started. But I want to point out two things. Number one, you're only beating inflation out by a few bucks. And number two, look at how much time that is. Now let's talk about uh, the relationship between where things fall on this chart and risk. We know that risk and return must go together. Did you guys know that? In my hometown, there were three industries. There were, there were cheese plants, there were bed spring plants, and there were dynamite plants. Actually, two of them. Now, let me ask you this question. Which do you think of those was the least risky. Cheese, bed springs, or dynamite? Cheese. Yeah, the cheese. Your biggest risk down at the cheese plant, if you kept your fingers out of stuff, was coming home with cheese packed in the treads of your boots and like animals would follow you. That was it. In fact, uh, most of my friends, their moms made their dads leave the boots outside, right? Because they were cheesy. Okay, number two. Of the two remaining, which do you think is safer, bed springs or dynamite? Bed springs. Uh, some people would occasionally shoot a wire through their hand and they would get uh, repetitive stress disorders from doing the same thing over and over again, but it was still safer than the final one, which was the dynamite plant, which is, by the way, where all my relatives work. Now, which job do you think paid the least? The cheese plant. 
Which job do you think paid the most? Yeah, the dynamite plant. Risk and reward must go together. Does that make sense? Okay, now what we're seeing here is that the riskier something is, the higher up on this list it's going to be. That makes the treasury bill the safest thing up here. That makes the treasury bill the safest thing up here. By the way, I've said that twice. Do you think it's useful to know that that's the safest thing up here? Mm -hmm. It's, no, he says no. Okay, so uh, let's talk about why it's so safe. It turns out when you loan money to people, there are two risks that you're worried about. The first one is the one that you have all experienced. It's called default risk. You loan your friend money and they don't pay you back. That's default risk. And then there is also price or interest rate risk. And that is the risk that a change in interest rates will make your investment worth more or less. In fact, let's talk about how that works. If you remember, the last slide of your chapter four uh, lectures was the price or value of anything is the present value of all the cash flows discounted at a rate appropriate to the risk of those cash flows. And so here we are, we've got these future cash flows and we're discounting them at a rate appropriate to the risk of those cash flows. Now, what if the investment becomes riskier? R goes up present value goes down. If you bought a bond, if you, if you loan someone money, and then the value of, the, or the interest rate or the risk went up, the value of that loan, if you were to sell it to someone else, goes down. Now, the cool thing is, what happens if interest rates drop? Then the value of the money that you've loaned them actually goes up. So that's pretty cool. So interest rate risk goes either way. Uh, default risk does not. If they default, uh, there's only bad default risk, right? There's no good default risk. Okay, now let's talk about uh, why we call the Treasury bill the risk-free asset. Actually, it's not truly the risk-free asset, but it's the closest thing we have to it. We call it the risk-free asset because uh, it's got such a short time to maturity of basically 0.25 of a year. And any little change in R is only going to get magnified to the 0.25 power. Now, contrast that to a 30-year treasury bond, where any little change in interest rate is going to get magnified to the 30th power. A much, much bigger thing, right? And so uh, we have much higher interest rate risk, and we'll get to that in Chapter 5. We have some much higher interest rate risk when we've got long terms to maturity. Short term to maturity like this has very little. So we're going to call this near zero for the Treasury bill. And in theory, the United States Treasury bill is default risk free. Why? What can the United States government do? Say again? Print more money, which is, by the way, the answer of the day, right? Print more money. Print more money. Now, there's a problem with printing more money. What's the answer? Inflation. You guys are living through it. In fact, you guys are some of the first students I've actually had that have, other than, you know, outside of me in the classroom, that you guys have experienced inflation and know how this works. And so we printed a bunch of money and we flooded all this money out there during COVID. And guess what? The chickens are coming home to roost. So that's why we don't necessarily want to do that. And so what's the other power that the government has that should prevent them from defaulting on their debt? Borrow more money. Borrow more money. Okay. Raise taxes. Raise taxes. Now, raising taxes is easy if you're in China. What would the difference between the Chinese system and the U.S. system be as far as raising taxes? What kind of form of government do they have? Do they have a democracy? No. 
And so uh, in the United States, it's a democracy. Politicians that promise to raise your taxes, what do you think happens to them? <coughs> yeah, they take it in the nose. Now, they're always promising to raise the taxes on someone else, right? But not on you. So eventually, though, the problem is we run out of someone else, and who do they come after? You. Okay, now, uh, but in a democracy, it's really hard to get taxes to be raised, so we end up instead doing more of this money printing exercise. And your answer about borrowing more money, that's the way we've been covering this thing for a long time. And, and who knows what's going to happen when eventually people are like, wait a minute, we're not going to loan you any more money. I suppose we'll have to see what happens. Okay, now, that's why, in theory, we're default risk-free. Now, there are some, a couple of things you need to know. Number one, right now, we're having this debt ceiling debate. Are you guys familiar with the debt ceiling debate? If it's not on Instagram, you guys, or TikTok, you guys don't know about it, right? Okay, so in theory, there is, or in reality, there is this level of debt that we're allowed to have as a country. And Congress must vote to raise that. Well, we've already hit that. And now the Treasury Department is scooting around trying to make sure we're going to cover all our payments because if we don't, we default. And we're going to lose this idea that our debt is default risk free. Now I'm going to tell you that there was actually a previous time when we did default on our debt. Does anyone know when it was? Any ideas? Usually someone has a guess. Ah, that's usually the most popular guess. It's wrong, uh, but it's usually the most popular guess. Now, here's the fun thing. Going into the Great Depression, we actually had a budget surplus. We actually had a rainy, rainy day fund, which is what made kind of priming the pump on those social programs kind of work. Uh, do we have that today? No. Okay, so that's a good guess, but it's not true. The answer is, right after the American Revolution. Right after the American Revolution. In case you don't know, uh, this used to be a colony of Britain, and we fought a revolutionary war against the British, and we had some help from the French. Do you think that's because the French like Americans a lot? Anybody here been to France? There, where they were like, yay, Americans! No. They just hated us less than they hated the British, right? And so that's, they don't give a crap about us, but they're, they're pleased that we're putting a stick in the eye of King George III. So what do they do? They loan us money, and with the money, we buy guns and gunpowder, things like that. They also send some troops, which is not, mighty nice of them. Okay, it's the end of the war. And we have the big end of the war party. By the way, this is the bullshit part, but it helps illustrate the point. We have the big end of the war party, and we invite, of course, the French, because they helped us out. And the French show up and they say, ha, 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 congratulations. Do I sound French? A little bit, yeah. Your nation. And we say, thank you, merci. And they say, now, pay us the money. And we're like, huh? And they say, you owe us money because you borrowed to fight this war against the British. And we said a couple of things. Number one, we're a nation of poor dirt farmers, which was true. We didn't have the kind of money necessary to pay back the debt. Number two, we didn't have our own currency. If the debt had been denominated in U.S. dollars and we'd had U.S. dollars, we could have just fired at the printing presses, right? And given the French a bunch of really expensive toilet paper. But instead, we say, well, what were we using? We were using the Spanish dollar. Why? Because there was a bunch of Spanish dollars flowing up out of Central America. They were popular as a means of exchange. We didn't have our own currency. We had something called the Continental, which people were actually using as kindling to light fires because it was so worthless at the end of the war. Because they just printed a bunch of them, right? Okay, long story short, we have no way to repay the, pay the debt. So what do we do? We default. But that's the last time. That's the last time we defaulted. 
And I kind of feel like we're uh, even with the French. We've saved them twice now, World War I, World War II. So not feeling too bad about stiffing them on the bill back in the day. Questions? Okay, now that you know why we think U.S. government uh, debt is default risk-free, you know that the Treasury bill in theory has none of this, has very, very little of this. And so we say this is the closest thing to a risk-free asset that you can get. And we say that the return that we earn on that is the risk-free rate. So anytime I talk about the risk-free rate, what we're talking about is the yield on the three-month Treasury bill. Okay. Now I want you to look at uh, a couple of things. Number one, look how smooth that line is. Do you see how smooth the Treasury bill's line is? Especially compared to some of these others. We're going to get to that here in a second. Now I want you to look up at long-term government bonds. Long-term government bonds would be the 30-year debt of the United States government. It's the 30-year debt of the United States government. And if you had invested a dollar in that, you'd have $123 at the end, which is like six times as much. Now, remember earlier we said two things go together, return and what? Risk. Risk. So what do we know about these long-term government bonds? They have to be safer or riskier than T-bills? Yeah, they got to be riskier. Now, where is that risk coming from? The default risk is exactly the same. It's the same borrower, right? It's this price or interest rate risk. It's the fact that we're magnifying the changes in the rate to the 30th power versus the 0.25 power. And so that's why long-term government bonds are riskier. They're still default risk-free, but they've got this price or interest rate risk. Now let's think about <clears throat> one other thing here. Compare the roughness of long-term government bonds to the Treasury bill. Which one's rougher? Which of those lines is rougher? Do you know what I mean by rough, not smooth? The long-term government bonds. Yeah, the long-term government bonds. And it turns out that this roughness is a manifestation of risk. And in fact, we can think of risk being the uncertainty about what the price of this thing is going to be tomorrow. And so you think about uh, the, the Treasury bill we're pretty sure what it's going to be worth tomorrow within a few cents. The long-term government bonds fluctuate more because of this interest rate risk issue. And so the more uncertainty about what something's going to be worth tomorrow, the rougher that line is going to be, the greater the risk. These things all go together. I should say the greater the risk, the more the uncertainty about what's going to be worth tomorrow, and therefore the line's rougher. Okay, now, <clears throat> I want you to notice the next thing up on this chart, and it is large company stocks. When we talk about large company stocks, we're talking about like the S&P 500, large company stocks. And uh, we need to point something out here. First of all, uh, if you invested a dollar way back when, it would be worth $3,532.36. Does that sound better than long-term government bonds? Absolutely it does. But there's a reason. What, do we, what must we know about large company stocks risk versus that of long-term government bonds? Yeah, it's got to be riskier because risk and return go together. We always do. Risk and return go together. Also notice that the line for large company stocks is rougher than that for long-term government bonds. I'm going to tell you that there is something missing from this chart. In between long-term government bonds and large company stocks should be, let's say, large company bonds. Large company bonds. Now let's talk about why bonds must be safer than stocks. At bankruptcy, you've got all the people standing in line to get paid. And always at the front is the government. And then we work our way back, and you've got the bondholders and all the other lenders. They get paid before the people at the very back of the line. The common shareholder. The common shareholder is at the end of the line. They have what we call a residual claim. Residual. Like a residue. A residual claim means I get the leftovers. I hate leftover Chinese food, but I love leftover money. 
right? The problem is the leftovers, sometimes they're this big, sometimes they're this big, sometimes, whoop, they're negative. And so that means that this common shareholder's position at the end of the line is the most risky <coughs> position in the entire line. And so we know stocks have to be riskier than bonds because the stockholders get paid after the bondholders. We do know, however, that uh, large company bonds have to be riskier than long-term government bonds because not only do they suffer from the same risk here, they also have default risk. They also have default risk. And so that's why I know that large company bonds should fall in between those two lines. Okay, now let's look at small company stocks. If you invested a dollar way back when, it would be worth $18,364.60. How does that compare to large stocks? Oh, come on, you guys can, even you can do that math, right? Which one's bigger? Small. Yeah, small stocks. Now, let's talk about why small companies are riskier. Any ideas? Say again? High default risk. Um, I agree, but why? Actually, it's, let's not even call it default risk because if a, a small company is starting out, would you loan them any money? No. So, why are small firms so risky compared to large ones? They have less financial security. Yeah, and so, so think about this. Right now, uh, between me and you, I'm just picking on you because you just spoke. Uh, who do you think is more financially secure? Probably you. Probably me. Why? I've been working since I was 16 years old. That's like 35 freaking years, right? Can you compete with that? I have $200 in a money management account. He has $200 in a money Now, that's perfectly fine for his stage of life, right? But the chances of him having a $201 emergency expenditure that would wipe him out much higher than me having a $201 expenditure that would wipe me out. It would take a boatload of $201 expenditures to wipe me out. Does that make sense? So that's the first point, that these uh, companies, as they get older and larger, by the way, age and size tend to go together. Did you know that unless they're started by the government, all large companies started as small ones? Does that make sense? Okay, now another thing is, we'll, we'll talk about the age. As the company uh, ages, what do you think happens to the knowledge of the management team? That improves, right? I mean, have you, uh, have you seen what's happened with Facebook? You guys, so I don't give a hang about Facebook as far as, you know, like checking for cat pictures. But what I do think is interesting is to watch the evolution of the management over time. And so in the beginning, Mark Zuckerberg says, we're not going to monetize Facebook. Do you think he evolved on that? Yeah. Now they're monetizing Facebook. And, and he's done some other things. He showed he was growing up. But then he did something really stupid lately. What did he do? Meta. You guys know what this is? Most people don't. I, you shook your head yes. So have you been in the, the Metaverse? No. No. They were, so they spent like billions of dollars creating this online community where people wear these unsightly, uncomfortable goggles on their heads and they can all interact in a room. And the number of uh, frequent users or of, of, let's just say committed users, 36. They spent billions of dollars to create this. Okay, so, but my question to you is, do you think Mark will learn from that? Yeah, do you think he'll do better down the road? Sure. And so... What happens is we see the leadership team grows, and then even as new people come in, there's some tribal memory. Hey, we've been down that road before. Hey, this is why that didn't work, right? Okay, so there's another one. And then another one I'd like to tell you about is uh, diversification. So we're going to learn that it's safer to hold stocks in a bunch of different companies than to just hold stock in one company. And large firms tend to be more diversified than small firms. So let's give an example here. Uh, we've got uh, General Electric, which one of their businesses is those windmills that 
create electricity. In fact, I know the CEO of their onshore wind operation. He won't hook up with me on LinkedIn, so, you know, that kind of tells you how we parted, right? Back to the story. We really didn't have a fight. Uh, he just doesn't know me anymore. So back to the story. Uh, wind energy for GE is probably just a rounding error on their overall income statement. Probably not that big of a deal. Compare that to a brand new startup that all they do is windmills. That's all they do. Now, what's happening around the world? Governments are starting to say, we're not going to subsidize wind energy anymore. And so as a result, uh, the sales and profits for windmills has gone way down. Do you think it's going to put General Electric out of business? No. Do you think it will destroy the startup? Absolutely it will. Something I want to point out about both the large company stock and the small company stocks is that this data is survivorship bias free. Let's talk about survivorship bias. When I was a little kid, I used to hang out in the barber shop and all of the World War II veterans hung out in the barber shop and they would talk about their glory days of fighting the Nazis and fighting the Japanese and, and I'm like sitting there, I'm a little kid and I'm like, yeah, this war stuff's great. Whose opinion was I missing out on? The people who got killed, right? Because the men from my hometown that died weren't sitting in the barber shop telling me how much it sucked. Does that make sense? Okay, so I had a survivorship bias on what I thought war was about. If we don't include firms that die along the way, then our data here will have a survivorship bias. But this data includes not only the companies that succeeded, it includes the companies that failed. Now, I had a student, and he's like, wow! He says, that's what it is, even including failures? He's like, what if we could just invest in the ones that are going to be a success? I'm pleased that you find that humorous. I said, you know, that's a great idea. Why don't you come to my office, tell me which ones they are, and we'll get rich together. He says, well, I don't know. I'm like, there's the problem, right? So that's why we can't choose which small ones to invest in. We can only just buy all of them, right? By the way, uh, after looking at this, what kind of stocks would you think you should be investing in? Yeah, yeah small company stocks. So think about this. I, I wouldn't say NASDAQ. We should say small company. NASDAQ has a te tech stink to it that I don't necessarily like. It's not diversified enough. Now let's think about this. It depends on the point in your life. If you guys are putting money away for retirement, can you afford some risk? How old are you? Are you 64? No! You've got a whole lifetime in front of you, right? And in fact, uh, here I am, 51 years old. I'm 14 and a half. I'm counting it down. I'm 14 and a half years away from retirement. <coughs> Even I say, you know, the stock market recently took a dump. And, I'm like, and people are like, dude, are you freaking out? I'm like, no. I said, it's going to come back. I just need to wait it out, right? But what if I were 65 years old? I might not have the ability to wait it out. And so the older you get, the further down on this list you should be. My dad is 82. He's got one kidney. Do you think he's uh, into taking big risks? No. I pointed out the fragility of life there with the one kidney thing. He's, he's doing fine. But my point is this. When you get to be in that age, you're depending on your investments for your consumption. And so he has to be more careful. Can he afford for his uh, portfolio to, to fall as much as I can afford for mine to fall? Absolutely not. Does that make sense? Okay, so at your age, most of your ages, uh, I would say, yeah, it's perfectly fine. And what I would recommend if you want to invest in small stocks is uh, an ETF, exchange traded fund, called SLY. SLY contains the S&P 600, which are 600 small stocks. 
S&P 500 contains how many stocks? 500, very good. And there are 500 large stocks. Why couldn't they have had 500 small stocks in the other one? Because then they would have both been S&P 500, would have confused the fire out of people. You think if they come up with a mid-cap one, they'll make it like S&P 700? I don't know. So my point to you is if you want to invest in small stocks, of course you don't do it one at a time because we're going to discuss how diversification is how you get rid of some of this risk. But that's a great way to do it. S&P 500, uh, there's actually a ETF for it called SPY. And so uh, I have two kinds of money which really doesn't make any rational sense, but I have two kinds of money. I've got my pre-tax retirement, which is the <coughs> stuff that they're taking out of my paycheck before taxes. goes into my, what you might call a 401k. And I'm putting it into the S&P 500. And then uh, I've got this rainy day of, of fund, and when it gets to a certain level, when it gets to the level that I want it to be, all the extra money that I get goes into the small stocks. It's money I can afford to lose anyway, right? You guys, at your age, if you're only saving for retirement, you're not saving for a house or to put kids through college, you could certainly afford to take the risk of the small stocks. Does that make sense? Enjoy it while you can. Of course, the other problem is typically at your age, how much money do you have? Somewhere between jack and squat, right? So what does that mean for you when you, start in, when you get into a job? as soon as you can. By the way, let's say that you get out of here and you're making $60,000 a year. That's probably gonna be more than you've ever made in your life. What I would tell you to do is to max out your 401k contributions in the beginning because you'll never miss the money. Does that make sense? And then every time past that, when you get a raise, try to push as much of that into your retirement as you can because you'll never miss the money. Okay. Now, let's talk about stock returns over time. We have a couple of what are called histograms here. A histogram, we create these buckets, and these buckets are in 10% return increments. And then for each one of those, we've taken a year, and we said, okay, uh, what was the return in this year? And so for the return for 1942, it was between 20 and 30%. And so we put it in that bucket. And we stack these things up and it graphically tells us where we have the most. And if you look at that top one, it actually looks like something you might be familiar with from your QBA class. What would it be? Yeah, the normal distribution. And in fact, we're going to make the assumption the stock returns are normally distributed. I'm going to tell you a couple of exceptions to that, but that's the assumption we're going to make. And for large company stocks, which is the top, it kind of fits. Now, uh, statisticians would tell us that we only have data since 1926. We really don't have a big enough sample size to know for sure, but boop, there you go. It looks kind of like it. Now, let's take a look at different years. <clears throat> for example, the year is 1927. I'm sitting with my friend Frank at the bar. Do you guys see what 1927's returns look like? And Frank tells me, hey man, I'm in the stock market stuff. It is so good. I'm getting returns between 30 and 40%. And I say, oh, Frank, that can't last. That's just crazy. 1928, what happens? Returns are between 40 and 50%. Frank says, told you so. And I say, yeah, but it can't keep going on. Actually, no, let's, let's change my mind on that. I'm like, you know, Frank, you're right. So I put my money in. What happens in 1929? Yeah, the crash. No, you might be surprised to see that it's only uh, between zero and minus 10. And here's why. When did the crash happen during the year? October, the end of October, right? And so it was almost the end of the year. It was like five, sixths of the way through the year. And so it had gone up quite a bit before the crash. Now, at this point, I might say, hmm, I'm going to sell out, but I think, you know, this is just a dip. It's going to start going back up. Where's 1930? Between negative 20 and negative 30. Now I'm getting really nervous. I'm like, well, certainly it can't do that three years in a row. What happens in 1931? Minus 40 to minus 
50. And I'm like, you know what? Oh, well, hang on. And so where's 1932? You have to look up a row. It's between zero and minus 10. I'm like, you know what? I'm freaking tired of this. Frank, Frank has led me down this primrose path. I'm really pissed. I'm, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm out. So I sell out. What happens in 1933? 50 to 60%. Why is my, what's my point in telling you this crazy story and walking you through history like this? Can you tell what's going to happen next year based on what happened this year? No. Just because we had uh, good returns this year, will we have them next year? Not necessarily. Just because we had bad returns this year, will we have bad returns next year? Not necessarily. You can't tell, you can't know. If you did, we wouldn't call it risk, right? Does that make sense? Okay, now, getting down to this, oh, by the way, and I want you to notice this. Take a look at uh, the, the highest return on large stocks is 60%. The lowest return is minus 50 for this time period. Look at small stocks. What is the lowest return there? Minus 60. It's even further down. Check out the highest return. 150%. Wow! Why do you think that these bounds, this range, is greater for small stocks than it is for large stocks. Yeah, that's risk. That's risk. And we're going to see that the taller and skinnier the distribution is, the safer it is. But that also means that you're going to have a lower mean return. The riskier it is, the wider and flatter it's going to be, but the higher the mean return will be. So you're going to have this trade-off. Does the bottom look nearly as normal as the top? No. So let's talk about something called the risk premium. The risk premium, we know that return and risk go together, but there is a basement amount that you can earn without taking on risk. We call that the risk-free rate. In the United States, we use the three months treasury bill as our proxy substitute or stand-in for the risk-free asset. And so the three months treasury yield is our stand-in for the risk-free rate. That's what you get for taking on no risk whatsoever. And so anything that you earn over and above that must be a compensation for bearing risk. Let me say that again. Anything you earn over and above the risk-free rate has to be a compensation for bearing risk. And so we can come up with this idea of the risk premium. It is the expected return on whatever this thing is you're investing in minus the risk-free rate. That's your risk premium. Anything that has any risk whatsoever should have some sort of risk premium. Now, this also gives us a handy tool for spotting scam artists. If someone tells you that you can earn above the risk-free rate and take no risk, what should your response be? Mr. Mers is more polite than I am. He's just saying no. I'm going to say bullshit, right? Nobody is going to pay you above the risk-free rate for taking on no risk. You are, in theory, getting more than the risk-free rate, therefore you must be taking on risk. This is a good way to spot Ponzi schemes. Ponzi schemes is where they use the investments of the new investors to pay returns to the old investors. And these things almost always start out with someone promising to pay you above the risk-free rate uh, for taking on no risk, or they'll tell you it's no risk. And then you'll say, is this insured by the FDIC. What do you think the answer will always be? No, but then they'll show you some bullshit photocopied thing that says that their accounts are insured by Lloyd's of London. You guys have probably heard of Lloyd's of London. You're like, ooh, that's fancy. It's a lie. Lloyd's of London does not insure Ponzi schemes. And so when you see stuff like this, you immediately should turn and run. If you want to learn more about stuff like this, watch American Greed. It's a pretty good show. Okay, 
So risk and reward got to go together. The bigger that risk premium, the more risk you're taking on. Does that make sense? Okay. Now let's talk about uh, the, some numbers for the things that we've been looking at. And we have everything here plus long-term corporate bonds, which we said was missing from our previous slide. And uh, let's talk about the returns and then look at the distributions. The U.S. Treasury bill, 3.6% average return. That's your risk-free rate. And you remember what I told you about tall, skinny distributions? That they have low risk and therefore they have to have low returns? Sure enough, U.S. Treasury bill, 3.6%. Now, intermediate government term government bonds, like 10-year treasury bill or bond, will be a little riskier. They've got a little more uh, distribution there, and so, of course, they've got to have a higher return. And then we have long-term government bonds. They are even riskier. They've got a larger distribution. They have to have a higher return. And then uh, we've got long-term corporate bonds. Remember me telling you that these things had to be, had to return more because they also include default risk, whereas the long-term government bonds do not. And then we have large company stocks at 11.8%, and they're an even larger spread. And as we've already seen, the small company stocks are spread out even more, and they return 16.5%. Now, the first thing we want to do is walk through here and calculate our risk premiums. Let's talk about what is the risk premium for the Treasury bill. This one's the easiest one. I'm going to throw at you all day long. Zero, she says, because the definition of the risk premium is the return on the thing minus the risk-free rate. And we said our Treasury bill was a stand-in for the risk-free rate. Therefore, the risk premium for the Treasury bill is zero. And I have that question on the exam. And students say, you didn't give us the risk-free rate to subtract. And I say, you don't need it. It's not actually a calculation. It's a concept. OK, uh, let's talk about what is the risk premium for intermediate term government bonds. What percent? Mr. Pelosi, can you do that in your head? So we're going from five point, or from we're taking five point five minus three point six. Which point nine? Yeah, it's one point nine percent. One point nine percent. Did you use your calculator for that? Okay. Now, uh, what about for long-term government bonds? What's the risk premium for them? How about I find it? Ms. Devin, how would I find? the risk premium for long-term government bonds. Just tell me the formula. You don't have to tell me the number. Um, subtract the return, or the yeah, return from, I don't know. Okay, so we said that the risk premium is the return on the thing we're looking at, which in this case is the, the long-term government bond. What's the return on the long-term government bond? Come on, let us down and answer. Yes, sir. Oh, 6.1. 6.1. Okay, now we're going to subtract the risk free rate. What did we say is our stand in for the risk free rate? Okay, you can go ahead and answer now. What's our stand in for the risk free rate? 1.9? 3.6. 6. It's the return on the Treasury bill. It's the return on the Treasury bill. Remember, the Treasury bill is our stand-in for the risk-free asset. Therefore, the return on the Treasury bill is our stand-in for the risk-free rate. Okay. So now, what, all we have to do is take 6.1 minus 3.6, and I believe that is 2.5. So that risk premium is 2.5% versus the last one, which is 1.9%. The risk premium is larger. The risk has to be larger. Now, we've got our long-term corporate bonds. Long-term corporate bonds, 6.4 minus, Ms. Dowden? 3.6. And when we do that, I think we get 2.8%. So it's a little riskier, higher risk premium. Uh, large company stocks. Let me pick on someone else here. 
Ms. Rowland, how are we going to find the risk premium for large company stocks? 11.8 minus 3.6, and I think that gives us what, 8.2? Sound right? Mm -hmm. And then finally, Ms. Pomeroy, tell me how to calculate the risk premium for small company stocks. Oh. <laughs> let's, let's take it easy. What's the return on small company stocks? 16.5%. 16.5%. And what do we have to subtract to that in order to get to the risk premium? We're just told to take that 3.6. Yeah, because it's the risk free rate. Very good. 16.5 yeah. minus 3.6. I think it's 12.9. See, you knew it. I knew it. Have confidence, <laughs> right? Okay. Now, let's talk about risk premiums versus risk. And in fact, we're going to get to this in a second here, but our mathematical measurement of risk that we're going to use is standard deviation. The greater the standard deviation, the greater the risk. Now let's think about, um, hopefully you guys, have you guys all had QBA something or other? So you've heard, you haven't? What? Did you have a statistics class? No. For this FB, no. Have I you had one before? Track, yeah. Oh, okay. So you know what standard deviation is? Yeah. Oh, very good. It's a measurement of dispersion. It's a measurement of dispersion around the mean. And so you remember those tall, skinny distributions? They've got a very small standard deviation, and so they have a very small distribution about the mean. The higher that standard deviation gets, the more those things start to spread out. Okay, so with U.S. Treasury bills, our standard deviation is 3.1%. In theory, it should have been zero, right? Because if we're using that for the risk-free asset, so we know it's not particularly perfectly risk-free. But as we go up here, notice that the standard deviation goes up along with the risk premium until we get to long-term corporate bonds. Take a look at the standard deviation for long-term government bonds and for long-term corporate bonds. Can anyone tell me what's wrong with this picture? Long-term corporate bonds have a higher return. Therefore, they are riskier. What does that mean that the standard deviation should be compared to long-term government bonds? It should be higher, but it's actually lower. It's actually lower. And we refer to this as an anomaly. It's an anomaly. It's something outside of what we would have expected from theory. Now, our friends, the statisticians, would tell us you don't have enough data it's entirely possible that you would have come up with this outcome at random simply because your sample was so small. And so maybe we shouldn't worry too much about it. But that is an anomaly. And then we move on up and notice that the standard deviations go up along with the risk premium. Questions? Okay. Higher standard deviation means higher or lower risk? Higher. Higher return means higher or lower risk? Higher. higher. Very good. So we need this mathematical measure of risk. And we just got through talking about standard deviation, and hopefully you guys have dealt with variance and standard deviation in your statistics class. And hopefully they taught you that both of these are measures of dispersion about the mean. And in fact, there's a relationship between standard deviation and variance. What is that relationship? If we take standard deviation, what do we have to do with it to get variance? Uh, square. square it. You got to square it. And so we could use either one of these because they're both indicators of risk. And so we have to decide which one we're going to choose. And the one that we're going to choose is standard deviation. The one that we're going to choose is standard deviation. First of all, it's in the same units as return. So risk and return standard, or standard deviation as a measure of risk is in the units of percent. Return is in the units of percent. They're the same. Variance, if we take standard deviation, which is a percent, and we square it, we get something called percent squared. Can any of you uh, interpret percent squared? 
I'm a mechanical engineer with a PhD in finance and just way more math than anyone should ever have to take. I cannot interpret percent square. The only thing I can tell you for sure is that the bigger that number is, it's riskier. That's all I can tell you for sure. And so that's why we are uh, going to use standard deviation. And there's one more reason that we're going to use standard deviation. And that is because we can define the normal distribution, the normal distribution with two numbers. As long as we have the mean and the standard deviation, we can actually define the normal distribution. And then we'll, we'll talk about the value of it, why it's so important. But, the, so those are the two reasons. Number one, understandable units. Number two, we use it in the normal distribution. That's why we use standard deviation instead of variance. So, go ahead and get your calculator out. We are going to calculate sample standard deviation. <clears throat> we're going to do it the hard way first. The way we calculate sample standard deviation is first we have to calculate the mean. Because remember, this is a measurement of dispersion around the mean. And so the mean here, your, uh, your grandma would probably call it the average. How are we going to calculate the mean of four numbers? What are we going to do? Add them together and divide by four. And so that's the first thing we're going to do here. Point one, three, seven, plus point three, five, eight, plus point four five one four minus point oh eight eight eight. So that's the sum. Now what do we do to get to the mean? Divide by what? Four. And there you go. That's going to be the number that we're going to subtract from each of these in order to get our deviation. So I'm going to go ahead and store that in location zero. Okay. Now, standard deviation, the way we calculate it is that we start by finding the deviation of each of those returns from the mean. So for example, what we're going to do is take the return at time one, which is 0.137. We're going to subtract 0.2144, which is that mean we just calculated, and that's going to give us the deviation of negative 0.0774. How would I find the deviation for year number two? Mr. Pulaski. Yes? What am I going to subtract? The mean. Uh, and, and the mean we calculated was 0.2144. And when I do that, I get 0.1436. Ms. Menahan, how would I get the deviation for the third one? I was going to take your 0.4514 and then subtract the 0.2144. Very good. And that's going to give us 0.2370. No? Now this last one is going to be kind of hairy because I got to remember to put that minus sign on it. Minus 0.0888 minus 0.2144 gives me minus 0.3032. The way we've been working through this so far is the way students are tempted to do it. And so they will write all this crap down and they won't put it in their calculator. I'm going to show you a better way. Now the next thing is we've got to square all those deviations. And so we're going to take that negative 0.0774 and we're going to square it. What happened to the minus sign? Yeah, so minus times the minus is positive. And that's one of the reasons that we're doing this, is to get rid of the minuses and the positives. Now, uh, we're going to add all those squared deviations up, and then we're going to divide by the sample size minus 1, which in this case is 3. And that's going to give us our variance. There's one more step to get the standard deviation. What is it? If you've got, did you hurt yourself? I just laid back a little too much. Uh, I stopped drinking before class. Okay, so how would I go from uh, variance to standard deviation? Yeah, we're going to take the square root. Okay, would you like to see the easy way? Yes. Okay, get your calculator up. Point one three seven. 
minus, recall zero, which is where I've got that mean hanging out. Same number. What do I do next? I'm going to work this way. Don't work this way. Work this way. I've got this number in my calculator. What should I do? Square, Square it. And then, oh, you're jumping ahead. We're going to store this in location one. And we're going to clear it. 0.358 minus, what do I do next? Recall zero. Equals 0.1436, what do I do next? Square it. And then, store where? Two. Two, very good. And then I've got 0.237 minus what? Recall one. Ooh, zero, very good. And then what? Square. Square it. Oh, wait a minute. No, I did that wrong. I started off with a deviation. Shoo. Did I screw up the other one too? Okay. Point. She doesn't know. <laughs> Point four five one four minus, uh, recall zero equals. Point two three seven. Then what do I do? Square it. And where do I store it? Three. And then. Point oh eight eight eight. What do I have to hit next? Num the minus, right? And then subtract. Recall zero equals, and then we're going to square it and store where? Store four. Now let's go back and make sure that I didn't screw up the second one. I did. Whew. Okay. Now I've got all the square deviations. All I've got to do is add those together. How am I going to do that? Recall one plus, recall two plus, recall three plus, recall four equals. That's my sum of square deviations. Now I'm going to divide by n minus three. N is the number of samples. We got four, so we're going to divide by three. And that gives us our variance. How would I get standard deviation from here? Square root. And there we go, 24.13%. Now, I will show you an even easier way next time. Questions? Okay.